Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Well, uh, back in my college days, I got my very first professional internship, and it was with a company called Motorola, and it was down there in Boynton Beach, Florida. They had just started building some brand new buildings, and they were hiring like crazy. And I was super, super fortunate to get that internship for two reasons. One, I was studying electrical engineering at the time, and so I wanted some professional experience. But probably more importantly was this. Boynton Beach, Florida was near my hometown of West Palm Beach, Florida. And in West Palm Beach, there was a girl. There was a girl. Yeah. And her name was Debbie. And you guys, most of you guys know the end of that story. So praise God for that. But the reason for the growth down there in Boynton Beach was basically one product. One product drove all of that growth down there, and that product was a pager or a beeper. Now, as I look out on the audience, I think there's about maybe 10 to 20% of you who have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> but that's the part of the audience that is really tech savvy, and you're already on your phones Googling it. Suffice it to say, pagers, maybe you think of it like this. They're the predecessor to modern-day texting, right? Except for you can only send a phone number. Couldn't send any emojis. But the, the Boynton Beach business sector really relied heavily on Motorola. Motorola employed 4,000 people at the time, and business, business was booming. Things were going great until something happened. And that something was this. You guys know it, the cell phone, right? And what happened when the cell phone came on the scene? What happened to pagers? Gone, obsolete. Does anybody in here have a pager? Not a single one. Oh, look at that. The Heberts have a pager. <laughs> the last time I had a pager was when I was waiting for the birth of my, my son. Anyway, cell phones made pagers obsolete. And what did cell phones do to that plant down there in Boynton Beach, Florida? What did it do to the 4,000 people, to all those brand new buildings? It made it no longer necessary. No longer necessary. In fact, that plant no longer exists. Motorola does not have a presence down there in Boynton Beach, Florida, because we have something better. Sad to say. In a similar way, Jesus on the cross, when he inaugurated the new covenant in his blood, he made the old obsolete. No longer needed, no longer necessary. And so all of those things of the old, they only had a picture, only a shadow of the great thing to come. And so we praise God that Jesus is here. Our scripture puts it this way in verse 20, that Jesus made a new and living way. And so the takeaway truth, the main idea I want you to pull from the message today is that Jesus' sacrifice has radically changed our relationship with God and it should radically change our relationships with each other. And as we unpack Jesus' sacrifice, I want you to see three things about what he has accomplished. He's accomplished for us radical access to God, a secure hope, and a new family of God with new privileges and responsibilities. You got that? Radical access to God, a secure hope, a new family with new privileges and responsibilities. So I want to unpack that first point. Jesus' sacrifice has accomplished for us radical access to God. 
And to do so, we have to ask the question, what did access to God look like under that old covenant? What did it look like? Well, we had the priesthood. We had the temple. We had to have a mediator, a go-between to access God. We had to worship at the temple. That's where you brought your offerings and your sacrifices. But scripture gives us a different picture when we think about the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies is that place in the temple, a special place separated by the rest of the sanctuary by a veil. And inside of the Holy of Holies was a special piece of furniture called the Ark of the Covenant. Now the Ark of the Covenant It was there in that tabernacle of old. It was there in the temple that Solomon built. It wasn't there in the second temple, actually. It had gone missing. You know, if you ever come across the Ark of the Covenant, we know from experience now that you don't ever want to open that thing up, right? (laughs) Bad things will happen if you open that up. Scripture gives us this picture, though, of the Ark, a beautiful picture It's a piece of furniture that's the footstool for God's feet. And research into ancient Near Eastern kings, you know what we found? We found that their footstools, the footstools of those kings, looked very similar to the Ark of the Covenant. And furthermore, they kept their laws where? At their feet. And so what do we find inside of the Ark of the Covenant? we find the tablets of stone, and on it written God's law. And what is this picture that we get? We get this picture of God, the great king over the universe. He's so immense. He's so infinite. He's so transcendent. He's so holy. Only his feet touching the earth on the mercy seat which rests on the ark in the most holy place. This is a picture of where heaven meets earth. And that veil, what did it serve to do? It prevented access for the people to go to God, prevented us from seeing God. And there was only one person allowed one time a year to enter into that most holy place, and that was the high priest. And why is that? Why couldn't we access God? It's because of our sin. Regular people like you and me, we didn't have that free access to God because of our sin and because he is so holy. He's so holy that sin cannot be in his presence. In fact, scripture gives us this picture in Isaiah chapter 6. We see the picture of the seraphim crying out, holy, holy, holy. He's the thrice holy God. Sin and evil cannot be in his presence. And regular people like you and me, we needed a go-between. We needed a mediator. We needed a priest. And so the priesthood, the priesthood was a picture of many things. It shows us the holiness of God. It shows us our sin. It shows us our inability to come to God on our own. We needed help. We needed help in the form of a special person, a designated person by God, this high priest, to be there for us. You know, the priesthood, it too was a shadow. The priesthood was a weak, weak shadow. Why is that? Because that high priest, he himself had to offer sacrifices for his own sins in order to go behind that veil. He had to do that. And when we think of the high priest, do you think that he was going in there confidently, like our scripture says today, with full assurance? If I was that high priest, I would be trembling. I was the only one that could go there. I'd be wondering about the sacrifices. Is it sufficient? But scripture is telling us there's a new and better way. Jesus comes and he offers himself a sacrifice for our sins. And in Hebrews 9, it says, He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. You know, Jesus, in his earthly ministry, he was in the temple, right? 
He taught in the temple, but he never went into that most holy place. But he did something far better. He went into the real most holy place. He went into the presence of God, and he did so not with the blood of an animal. He went with his own blood. And he didn't go there time and time again like the high priests of old. He went there one time making one sacrifice for our sins. Those sacrifices in the past, Hebrews 10.4 says this about it, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Not so with Jesus' blood. He was the perfect lamb of God and his sacrifice was acceptable to God. And so do you see that Jesus is a better high priest. Jesus is a better sacrifice. Jesus is a far superior temple. In fact, you can look at all of Hebrews and summarize it this way. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. And I have, I have to thank uh, Sam Lero. I don't see him there today, but I heard him say that a couple years ago, and it just stuck with me. Hebrews is about that. Jesus is better. He's better. And so the priesthood, the sacrifices, the temple, all of those things in the old covenant are no longer needed. Just like the pagers and payphones of the past, we have something far better. We have Jesus and when he, Jesus died on the cross in Matthew 27, 51, it says, And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. And that indicated to us that access was wide open to God. The temp, that veil that prevented us from having access to God was torn down. And I love this picture in Revelation chapter 11. This is a picture at the end of the ages, at the consummation of God's kingdom. We see this, God's temple in heaven. It was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. The temple was opened, and we could see the ark. And why can we see the ark? Jesus tore down the veil, and now full access to God was available, and it confirms what Jesus did on the cross. I want you to see in verse 20 the connection between the veil and the flesh. The old way to access God was through that veil, through a high priest, through the veil. That's the physical way. The new way in verse 20 is through the flesh of Jesus. And so we no longer have that old access. We have a new way to God, and it's through his son, Jesus. It's why Jesus can say in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes through the Father except through me. And Peter can declare this, and there is salvation in no one else, and there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other way. And do you see why? Jesus has made a new and living way. Jesus is God's approved way to himself. There is no other way. But because of what Jesus has done through his sacrifice, our scripture says we can approach the most holy place with confidence. We can draw near to God with full assurance of faith because Jesus has made a new and living way. Well, Jesus, through his sacrifice, also gives us a secure hope, a secure hope. In verse 23, the author says, we should hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, without wavering. It's interesting he chooses the word hope there instead of faith, right? We could have, he, he could have said, hold fast your faith, but he doesn't say that. He uses the word hope. And those two words are related. John Frame goes so far as to say that hope is a kind of faith. Hope is a kind of faith. It's a faith in the future promises of God that he will fulfill it. So hope is a result of faith. Hope is a product of faith. 
And let me say this, if, if you don't have true faith, there is no hope. Without faith, there is no hope. There's only hoping, only hoping, right? Thomas Nagel, he's an atheist. He's the professor emeritus at NYU of law and philosophy, so he's a really intelligent guy. He's written a few books, very studied man, and I want you to hear what he says. I speak from experience, being strongly subject to this fear myself, and in the context, the fear he's talking about is fear of religion. I want atheism to be true, and am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right in my belief, it's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. Did you hear what he says? I hope there is no God. Now if that's not a picture of someone who's just hoping. He doesn't have a secure hope. He doesn't have a secure hope, and this man needs the hope that's only found in Christ. He's only hoping, and let me ask you, where is your hope? Have you come in here this morning, and you're only finding yourself hoping or wishing? Well, let me say this to you, that you can have a secure hope. You can have a confidence in approaching God. If you will turn away from your sins and turn in faith to God's provision, as we've talked about, Jesus making the only way to God. Turn away from your rebellion and turn in faith and trust in Jesus Christ to pay the penalty for your sins, you can be forgiven. And I invite you this morning, you may have come in here just hoping you can have a secure hope, and I invite you to accept Christ, to follow him, to call him Lord and Savior. For the original audience, this, this type of unwavering hope, it would have been something special. If we read further down in chapter 10, we'll see in verses 32 to 35 that, that these orig original audience, these Hebrews, they were going through some tough times. Uh, it mentions persecution, suffering, affliction, confiscation of pro property, public reproach. And scholars think that this might be the time of Roman rule. And so we know, and in particularly if it's underneath Nero, that the Christians would have been suffering greatly. And so this idea of a secure hope would have been special. So many of us today, I know, are going through really tough times, really tough times. Some of you are struggling with health. Some of you are facing difficult relationships, broken relationships. Some are depressed. Some are stuck in the throes of addiction and can't seem to get out. Some are grieving the loss of loved ones, and I'm here to say, if your faith is in Christ, you can have this secure hope. Because in verse 23 it says, he who promised is faithful. He who promised is faithful. So our hope rests not in our circumstances. It rests not in ourself. It rests on the unchanging character of a faithful God, a God who is trustworthy, a God who doesn't break his covenant promises, a God who does what he says he will do. That's where our hope is. And so our hope is not how well we can hold on to him. Because if I asked some of you guys this morning, I'm sure you would say, Brian, I've lost my grip on him. Or maybe I'm only holding on by a thread, but it doesn't rest. Praise God, it doesn't rest in us. It rests on God, and it rests on how well he has his grip on you, how secure his grip is on you. This is the God who promises, I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
He who promised is faithful. He will do what he says he will do. So be encouraged. Confess your hope without wavering. Why? Because he who promised is faithful. Well, Christ's sacrifice has also given us a new family. But in that new family, we have great new responsibilities and privileges. And in verse 21, we see this reference to the house of God. And we know now that it's not a house like this built with cement and wood. It's not referring to the temple of old. It's referring to us. We are the temple of God, and if we are in Christ, we are that beautiful household of God, Jesus being the ultimate temple of God. Well, if we are the new household of God, we have new responsibilities and new privileges, one of which, in verse 25, says we should not neglect meeting regularly. And you know what? In that early church, apparently there were already slackers in the early church because the author says it was already the habit of some, sad to say. And I want to throw out to you a very sad statistic that I found about the evangelical church here in America. 42% of evangelicals attend church 50% of the time or less, okay? And I've looked at covenant statistics about a year or so ago, and the good news is we're better than that. But the bad news is we're not that much better than it. And what it means is that four in 10 of us, four in 10 of us are only coming to church twice a month or far less. It's a sad and disheartening thing. What does it say about us adopted sons and daughters of the king, granted this this radical access to God through Christ, given a secure hope, and yet we wake up and we say, nah, I don't think I want to go this week or next week, and we check out. Well, research has given us many reasons why church attendance is poor. I'm going to tell you some of those. One is I don't have time. Either I'm working too much, and when I'm not working, I want to take some time off. I want to do some recreation. Or maybe my sports league is on Sunday, or my kids' sports league is on Sunday, and so that's what I'm going to do. How about this one? There's not a church I agree with. There's not a church I agree with, so that's why I don't go. And this one, I've been burned by church. And what they mean when they say that is I've been burned by its leaders, or I've been burned by the people in the church or some ministry. How about this one? I don't need other Christians. I only need my Bible and God. I only need my Bible and God. Well, one observation uh, and one disturbing trend as we look at American Christianity is that we have really adopted a consumer mentality towards the church and everything else, actually. It's a mentality that says, man, I've got to have comfy chairs. I've got to have good coffee. I've got to have music that suits me. I've got to have a preacher that doesn't preach too long or too short. Gives me a message that I can relate to. I've got to have ministries that meet my needs. And so we've lost the idea that church, it's not about us. Church is primarily about him. It's about worshiping and declaring the praises of Almighty God. That's what it's about. And secondarily, it's about us, the body of Christ. But it's not about me. It's not about me. And it's not, certainly not consistent with a family, sons and daughters who've been adopted by this great king. Let me give you an example. Debbie and I, we dated for about four years or so. And then we got married, and with our marriage, we entered into a new relationship, a new relationship that gave us new responsibilities and new privileges. And so think about this. Debbie's saying, hey, why don't you join me for dinner? And I say, no, I think I'm just going to warm up a hot dog and play video games. (laughs) Does it? What about, what about, you know, I'm, Debbie says, I'm sitting out by the 
the fire pit. You want to come and join me and let's spend time together and get to know each other better? And I say, nah, I'd rather do something else. I'm going to go fishing. It doesn't even make sense, granted new privileges, new responsibilities, to, to, to isolate myself and to totally check out. But I think we need to dig deeper into those reasons and see what lurks behind them. And I want to ask, I want to unpack this one reason that says, I only need my Bible and God as an illustration. I only need my Bible and God. And of course, there's many reasons someone could say that. Um, it goes along with this idea that I haven't ch- found a church that I agree with, right? Only me and God, we can do true worship. Only me and God can I find the real truth. And, and you guys may not believe it, but this is, this is pervading our culture today. People are checking out of, of church. Institutional Christianity is being rejected. But, but think about what's behind that attitude. It's an attitude that says, you know what? My theology is better than yours. I have it all figured out. I can't go to these other churches because they're always saying something wrong. And what about this? There, only I can be in fellowship with God. When I go to church, I have to rub up against those sinners. And that person, yeah, what, look at the movies they go to. Look what they're doing with their life. Look what kind of car they drive. In a sense, they're saying, I'm better, I'm holier than they are. And so the only way to have pure worship is to be with me and God and the Bible. And I would say that behind that type of attitude is an attitude of spiritual pride. And if we unpack some of these other reasons, we're going to find things like my comfort, my convenience. That's more important. We're going to find self-love. We're going to find idolatry. We're going to find wanting to be in control and be Lord of my life. And what do we call all of these things. We don't call them reasons. We don't call them excuses. We call them what it is. We call them sin. But the Bible gives us a picture of biblical community that we need to be in biblical community. And if we look in Acts chapter 2, we see this clearly. We see the disciples, what they, they did. Day by day, they were going from house to house, breaking bread, holding fast to the apostles' teaching, praying, fellowship. I mean, we get the picture that these people were doing much more than just coming here once a Sunday. They were doing life together. They were doing life together. The New Testament simply assumes that God's people are gathering regularly for worship and to do life together. If you are in Christ this morning, each of you have been given a spiritual gift. And what's that gift for? Is it for you? No. Your gift is for everyone else, actually. My gift is for you, and your gift is for everyone else. And the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5 goes so far to say, you belong to each other. You belong to each other. That's a radical idea. I don't belong to myself. I belong to you guys. You belong to us. That's a picture a biblical community. Many of the exhortations and the commands in the New Testament, they can't be carried out in isolation. They can't. It's meant to be lived out in a local community of believers. And let me give you one such example. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, how can you bear one another's burdens if you don't even know what they are? You've got to be in deep biblical community for someone to even grant you the privilege to say that they're suffering or that they need help. And then you have to be there to bear their burdens. And the scripture says that if you do so, you fulfill the law of Christ. What is he referring to? He's referring to the second greatest command. We live out the second greatest command in community. So if you check out, you can't do that can't do that. Also in verses 24 and 25 of our passage today, we see other commands 
Stir one another up, spur one another on to love and good works. Encourage one another as you see the day drawing near. You can't do that if you're not even here, if you're not engaged in deep community. We say this often here at Covenant, the church is plan A for God to reach the world. The church is also plan A for God's people. The church is plan A for God's people. There's no plan B. There's nothing else described in Scripture except for the church. This is God's design that we grow in community. And sanctification happens in the context of our relationships. And this is why one of our four strategies is grow. Grow. Last week, Jerry unpacked worship as one of our strategies And the strategy is how we're going to accomplish the mission. And so grow gets at the idea of being in discipleship. That's why we have this emphasis on small groups, on triads, on journey, on plugged in. That's why it's such a big thing at our church. It's one of our main strategies. And last week, we also introduced a survey. And in that survey, there were lots of questions, question marks. And the mark is a measure of spiritual formation. One of the questions we asked was this, where can I safely share anything without condemnation? And that gets at the idea of deep biblical community. You can't do that unless you're in deep biblical community. So in closing, Christ's sacrifice has done many things for us. He's opened up this great new way to God. He's given us a secure hope that we can stand on He's blessed us with this wonderful family of God. And so I urge you, I urge you, press into this family of God and do this hard work of building relationships with messy, messy people. It's hard work. It's hard work. Because when we build relationships with messy people, you know what happens? Their sin gets in the way, our sin gets in the way, and it's, and it's hard, but it sanctifies us. And we're never going to be motivated to do that, to press in, to engage in the messiness of other people until we see that that's exactly what Jesus did for us. That's exactly what he did for us. He took our messiness. He took the sin of our life and he nailed it to the cross. Praise God for that. Why? So that we could be the family of God and have this great privilege. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that because of Christ, we have so many great privileges. We have every spiritual blessing you say in your Son, in Christ, and we praise you for that. Father, I want to pray this morning for the person here who's come this morning, who's come into our sanctuary, and they are just hoping. They don't know what it means to have a secure hope, and I pray, Lord, that you would work in their heart May they not delay in coming to you, but may they hear the words of life and embrace it. Trust in what you have done for them. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.